Okay, so the title of the course is Metric and Hilbert Spaces, as you all know. Um, but really that's just two items out of a longer list of things that start with an adjective and then the word space, right? So there's many different notions of uh, space that come up in mathematics, both pure and applied. And what I want to do today is sort of uh, give some context before we get into the details of metric, topological spaces, Banach spaces, normed vector spaces, and then eventually Hilbert spaces. Okay, so, I mean, obviously that's a difficult question, right? What is space? Um, so let's first sort of acknowledge that one of the reasons that concepts of space are so central to mathematics is that we all have some sort of neurological or psychological familiarity with space, right? Just because we've evolved to move around in space and solve problems in space. Um, so partly the concepts we have of space are abstracting out some of the commonalities of those various solutions that we've found. Um, so we're going to start with Euclidean space, obviously. That's the notion of space we're most familiar with. And then we'll move toward uh, more sophisticated notions of space. But I want to start in a more colloquial sort of uh, setting. All right, so let's, let's start with the dictionary definitions of space before we get into more technical matters. So maybe the first definition that you'd see in a dictionary is the following. So space is a continuous area or expanse uh, which is free, available, or unoccupied. Now these definitions are more interesting than you might think, especially the third one I'm going to give. What's interesting about this definition is it's sort of implicitly contextualizing the idea of space in terms of objects, right? It's free of objects. It's available for objects. There are no objects in it, right? So this is the idea of space as a stage for things. Now this is important because what's driven our development, is even the most sophisticated notions of space that we have, uh, is things like physics, right? Where space is a stage for things and for motion. So the second of the colloquial definitions that I'm going to mention is connected more with motion. Okay, so this is, these are just verbatim from my dictionary. The dimensions of height, depth and width within which <coughs> all things exist and move. Well, the exist part is sort of overlapping with the first definition, right? Uh, but this is interesting. So this is space as a stage for motion. You know, if you like, you could associate this first definition more with Descartes, right? And the second definition more with, say, Newton. And the third definition is perhaps the most interesting. <coughs> which is a blank printed between words. <laughs> characters, numbers, etc. Well, you laugh because it seems <laughs> totally incongruous, right? This is a class on metric and Hilbert spaces. I mean, okay, yeah, fine. There's space on the page, I suppose, but what's that got to do with mathematics? Well, actually, there's, this is perhaps the deepest of the three, right? Now, why is that? Well, what's the significance of the blank between characters? <coughs> well, for instance, you wouldn't be able to read a book if there were no blanks. Or to put it more technically, 
the capacity of a communication channel to transmit information is contingent on the absence of noise, right? So the whole point of a stage is that it's empty. Right, so there's something to the fact that space is a very low entropy kind of physical system, right? It's very ordered, there's nothing in it most of the time, right? At least down to some very low resolution. So that it's, that's a property it has in common with the blank page, and it's the capacity of the blank page, I mean, the fact that the blank page is blank that allows it to carry information, in this case, <coughs> characters, words, and so on. Um, so this is a perspective on space that is not very well understood. This is actually the subject of current research, sort of this information theoretic point of view on uh, space, more in physics than in mathematics. Um, we're not going to talk much about this, but it's sort of very interesting to see this in the dictionary and to, to discuss it briefly. Okay, so most of the conceptualizations that we've developed and proved many beautiful theorems about within mathematics are associated with these first two colloquial notions of space. That is, space is a stage for things. I mean, that's what geometry is about, right? Or differential geometry, algebraic geometry, um, Euclidean geometry in the sense of, you know, the original Euclid geometry. Uh, or space is a stage for motion, that's symplectic geometry, um, the kind of geometry that you see in classical mechanics. Uh, I mean, also the kinds of geometries we'll discuss, I mean, Hilbert space, for instance, is connected with motion, in particular in the setting of quantum mechanics. So these ideas have been very heavily developed in the last you know, hundreds of years. So what I want to do now is just enumerate um, some of the different notions of space that I've, I mean, many of them I've already mentioned in passing, and explain how those notions of space, you know, for instance, uh, inner product space, I think many of you have taken a linear algebra class, so you've, you've seen inner product spaces and things like that. Um, okay. So. so I want to go through those notions and briefly describe them. And I'll describe them in terms of the structure that they abstract away from Euclidean space. So uh, this is a overview of formal notions of space. Okay, so those were informal or in intuitions about space. Uh, those are important because that's where we start. But here are some more formal uh, quasi-definitions. So beginning with Euclidean space. So we obtain various abstract notions of space. Abstracting, it's not a very interesting sentence, by abstracting particular structure on Rn. All right, so of course that's you know, how we come to thinking about space, I suppose, Rn as a consequence of Descartes and, and the development of real analysis. But that's an incredibly highly structured object. And in particular, it's just a single object. So what we do is we just enumerate well, for instance, the first abstraction you're familiar with, I suppose, is probably abstract vector spaces. Right, so an abstract vector space, at least over R, is obtained by just remembering only the addition and scalar multiplication of vectors. should all be familiar to. Um, 
metric spaces, of course, is one of the topics we'll develop in this course. Uh, but just roughly speaking, we obtain the notion of a metric space by remembering only the Euclidean distance as a function on pairs of vectors. You might ask, why do we need you know, so many different notions of space? Why isn't there just the right answer, the correct, absolute, sort of universal notion of space, uh, which is correct for all situations? Um, that's a good question. I'll address it a bit later. I mean, it's sort of clear, I suppose, the first answer to that would be that it would just be very complicated to use all these structures all at once. So topological spaces, which are again another focus of the course. Um, so this is a notion which abstracts the set of open balls in Euclidean space. So, I mean, for example, by this definition, what I mean is, so take Rn, take all these subsets of Rn, indexed by non-negative, or sorry, positive numbers epsilon and vectors x. So that's this two-parameter family of subsets. Take that collection of subsets. That collection has some properties. It's well, more precisely the basis for a topology. Uh, the properties of that collection of subsets, if you study what properties that collection has, you extract the abstract notion of a topological space. So we'll do that uh, perhaps next lecture. Normed vector spaces. Well, given that there's an adjective in front of vector space, you would expect that a normed vector space abstracts this structure plus well, the norm. So it abstracts the operations of addition and scalar multiplication, and also the norm. All right. Well, there's clearly some overlap with the notion of a metric space, right? Because the norm of a vector, if you take the norm of the difference of two vectors, allows you to recover the distance. So these are not sort of orthogonal independent notions. So an inner product space abstracts, again, the addition and scalar multiplication. And in addition, the, well, the dot product. OK, so that's, I mean, I could, I could keep going. Uh, but for the purposes of this course, that's probably the major ones we're going to look at, with the exception, of course, of Hilbert spaces, which is not about Rn, but Cn. I'll discuss that in a second. But what I want to do first is just quickly go through this list and connect it up to the first disappeared up there. I'm just connected up to these two colloquial notions. All right, so it's clear that, I mean, if you've taken an undergraduate physics course, for instance, uh, the first reason you learn about vectors is to discuss forces uh, and momentum and so on. So the idea of adding vectors or scalar multiplication of vectors uh, clearly has some connection to uh, motion and talking about motion in the setting of Rn. <coughs> Metric spaces, well, that's, that's about measuring distances. I suppose that's connected both to objects and motion. Topological spaces, I mean, this is more subtle. 
right? So both of these notions, I think, uh, don't cause anybody very great difficulty. Topological spaces is a more subtle notion. It's also more fundamental because it's encoding something which is less obvious, uh, but even more fundamental than distance or motion, which is the notion of locality. This is absolutely crucial. And this is the notion which is precisely captured by the notion of a topological space. That's pretty clear from the notion of balls, right? I mean, the idea of a ball is telling you what is nearby. So that is the notion that's captured by topological spaces. This is not really reflected in that list because this is sort of beyond our colloquial ideas of space to some degree. Although, I mean, well, of course we have these words and we know what it means to say local versus global, for instance. Norm and vector spaces, I mean, this is tied up with the earlier things. So maybe I'll say motion and measurement. Right, because I can extract, as I said, the metric distance from the norm. Uh, and as we all know, inner product spaces are about angles. Okay, because the dot product is, is about angles. All right, so let me add Hilbert spaces to this list just briefly. Um, So if we start again with CN, well, what's the difference between CN and RN? I mean, the new structure which is present on complex numbers, which is not available for real numbers, is the complex conjugate, right? So there must be some notion abstractly which captures also, in addition to, say, the vector space structure on CN, the operation of complex conjugation, uh, and that's what Hilbert spaces do. in particular vector spaces, so they're taking the structure of addition and scalar multiplication. And also abstracting the pairing on, so these are two vectors in CN, which is obtained in this way. Okay, and it's not meant to be sort of immediately clear what the geometric or conceptual content is of this operation, right? I mean, given your experience sort of in undergraduate calculus or linear algebra, you have a good grasp of what the inner product means. Uh, this is meant to be a bit more mysterious, uh, but we'll come back to that later. Okay, so that's a list of abstractions um, which we're going to discuss in this course. What I want to do for the rest of the lecture is uh, starting in a sort of very particular situation, sort of motivate why we end up working in a particular one of these abstractions. That will stand in for a general sort of argument for why we sort of need this laundry list of abstractions to begin with. Okay, any questions about, uh, well, what's happened so far? Okay. Okay, so the point, which I think is not completely obvious, is that the abstraction that we want to use for a given problem uh, depends to a large degree on the symmetries that the problem possesses. So there's a fundamental connection between the notion of an inner product space and the symmetry group SO2 of rotations of the plane. And that is also true, well, to a lesser extent of topological spaces, but uh, for all these other notions, right? There's a notion of symmetry which is closely connected to this particular abstraction of Rn that we've chosen. And I want to explain that connection in a concrete example uh, now. All right, so this is quite elementary. So to some extent, I want to recapitulate quickly the process you went through already to get to this point in learning about abstract vector spaces, right? I mean, why abstract vector spaces? Why not just Rn all the time, okay? And the reason for that, I hope, was explained to you in some form uh, like the following. Uh, 
So we're going to consider two observers. I mean, I could do R3 or R4, but uh, let's stick with the plane. So we're going to consider two observers in the plane. We'll call them O1 and O2. Well, we could consider them to be situated in two distinct points with two distinct orientations, uh, but let's, for simplicity, have them sitting at the same point, possibly with a different orientation. So, so we're going to use X to stand for the plane without a pre-existing coordinate system. There's various ways, I mean, I'm not describing that as a set, right? I'm, I mean, so this is a bit of a vague, uh, what X exactly stands for is not being made perfectly clear here. Conceptually, it's clear, and I'm going to delay making precise sense of what I mean at, by the words without a pre-existing coordinate system uh, for a moment. So let's just proceed. So we can imagine that two observers situated at the same point in the plane underline for origin <coughs> and we'll suppose that O2's coordinate system okay so we suppose both observers pick um, coordinate systems and that O2's coordinate system is from the point of O1 rotated by an angle of theta So, then we have the following picture. <clears throat> okay, so this half of the board is X before I drew anything. So there's no axes, canonical axes sitting in X. X just is. But observer one, for instance, whose axis system I'm going to draw with the white chalk. And I'll try blue. Okay, so the axis system for O1 is white. And then we've got another axis system. This is going to be tricky. Okay, so that's theta. Okay, so let's suppose that there's uh, so given a point, both both observers uh, can measure its coordinates clearly. Let's say it's here. All right, so suppose that's A, that's B, that's A prime, that's B prime. Okay, so we've all done the following calculation. Let me call a third color to indicate this is independent of both of the observers. So both of the observers agree on that distance. That's nothing to do with the coordinate system. Well, so we believe, right? That's one of our sort of implicit uh, priors about how space works, that they're going to agree on that distance. Okay, so what will these observers write down as the coordinates of that point? Well, this is the observation of the first observer. And just by looking at that, if we call this angle psi. All right, so what's that? 
that's L cosine theta plus psi, L sine theta plus psi. Okay, so just use the double, or the sum of angles formulas, uh, and you'll arrive at the following. Okay, so the point of choosing a coordinate system is that it equips both observers with the ability to translate points in X into points in R2, right? That's what measurement is. So let's call them M1, which is the measurement function for observer 1, and M2, which is the measurement function for observer 2. Well, these are bijections, right? Okay, so this... bijection. So what is this calculation saying? Well, it says, I mean, this is m1 of x, right? It says m1 of x is equal to, well, this operation on R2 applied to m2. So it's convenient to represent that equation, m1x equals r theta m2x, uh, by a diagram like the following one. So there's x, there's r2. Observer 2 makes his measurements, her measurements, gets a point in r2. Observer 1 makes their measurements, gets a point in r2. And the relation between those two measurements is the transformation r theta. And as we know, this is a, an isomorphism. That is, it's linear and a bijection. Um, so just a piece of terminology. So when I say that a diagram commutes, this means, I mean, in the particular case of a triangle, for instance, which is the only case that will appear today, uh, the two ways from the source sort of vertex to the end vertex agree as functions, right? So to say that this diagram commutes is just the synonym for saying that R theta composed with M2 is equal to M1, which is, of course, uh, what this says. Okay, so we've got our two observers. We've got a transformation of R2, which relates the measurements which are made by these two observers. And that transformation is, uh, well, a rotation. That's, that's pretty reasonable. Okay, and that's the symmetry I'm talking about, all right? <coughs> R theta is a symmetry of R2. I mean, it's a linear automorphism of R2. That's what a symmetry um, is. Okay. So uh, the point of this discussion was to motivate the whole idea of abstracting away from Euclidean space. In this case, to get to, well, first of all, vector spaces, and then secondly, to inner product spaces. And as I said, I'm laying this groundwork in order to sort of make the process of abstracting out the other structures uh, seem more sort of transparent. OK, any questions so far? Okay, so the next question is, well, just because you can write down coordinates of a point, it doesn't mean that every quantity you can compute from those coordinates is meaningful. Right? That is the essential point 
which lies behind the notion of abstract vector spaces. Okay, so the first quantity that we associate to points in the plane about which these observers do agree, and which is therefore, in the sense I'm going to use it, use the word, uh, this is a quantity which is meaningful, is length, right? This is a bit of a cheat because this is almost what goes into the setup that they agree about the length, uh, but let's ignore that. So, but what do I mean by this? I mean that the, well, first of all, the length is not something we compute directly from x in x, right? And here's x. We have a choice of origin. That's where both the observers are sitting. I mean, it's not, the, it's not a prior the origin of a coordinate system. It's just a point, right? And both the observers are sitting there. And then we've got some other point. Well, how are we supposed to evaluate a real number which is associated to the distance between that origin and some arbitrary point? Well, we can't just attach that number to the point without first measuring something, right? So that's what, uh, which way was it? M2, yeah. Okay, so we can first measure to a coordinate system and then we can compute the length, right? I mean, there's a formula for that, right? But we have to apply the formula to some numbers, so we need to measure the coordinates first. Well, the second observer, well, the first observer, the other observer, uh, can do the same thing, evaluate that formula given their measurements. And of course, this diagram commutes. They agree on the lengths, right? So that is to say that the length, I mean, in the usual Euclidean sense, and you think of an actual formula for evaluating that, uh, agrees no matter which of the two coordinate systems we use to write down the pair of numbers associated to x. Okay. Um, well, we can fill in the horizontal arrow in that diagram, so to speak. That is to say, since we know that m1 is r theta of m2, to say this is just the same as to say, so to say this for all x, it's the same as to say the length of r theta of m2x is equal to the length of m2x for all x. Right? So this, this row here is just a formal statement of, of that informal sentence. Right? That formal statement is the same as this one. Now observe that m2 is subjective. Right? I mean, m2 is a bijection, in fact. So to say that these agree for all x is equivalent to saying that r theta applied to any vector is just the length of that vector for all v and r2. Okay, so of course this is not saying very much, uh, but what we've done here is we've removed the x, right? That's actually more significant than it seems at the moment. So this is a statement about some invariance property of the uh, functional we're interested in, in this case, the norm, with respect to a symmetry of the space where our measurements land. It's not talking about x anymore. All right? It's just talking about the place where our measurements land, that is Rn, and the operation on Rn that we're talking about, in this case, the norm. Okay, so rotation doesn't change lengths, as we all know. So you can evaluate the left-hand side just using the multiplication by that matrix, work it out, and you'll see the lengths are the same. You've all done that exercise. Okay, so what I've really done here is I've filled in this line Now, by what I said over there, I mean, what I'm using to go from here to here is that this triangle commutes. This little circle here indicates that a triangle commutes. Uh, 
So m2 and then r theta is m1, right? That's what we agreed over there. That's the relationship between the measurement systems or the measurements of these two observers. So to say that this triangle commutes, sorry, the diamond, uh, is therefore just to say that this commutes. This is the argument that I gave from this line to this line using that m2 uh, was a bijection. Okay, so the agreement about length, length being some invariant or some number we're associating to points in X given a fixed coordinate system uh, is encapsulated by commutativity of that bottom diagram, which as I said has nothing, it's not talking about X. Okay, so well, it's encapsulated by commutativity of this diagram, which is simply to say that the norm as a function after r theta is just equal to the norm. Okay, the reason to go through this process is that this is, I mean, you're probably not used to thinking about this top part, right? I mean, if you're a physicist, this is how you talk about uh, many things, including symmetries. But for mathematicians, we typically tend not to talk about this. We'll, we'll typically just talk about the bottom part. And that's okay, we've removed it already, right? But really, conceptually, it's interesting and important to have started with this idea of, well, a space without a pre-existing coordinate system. Okay, but I don't want to belabor that too much. Is there a question? No? Okay, so let's talk about something they don't agree on. Well, what do I mean? So what I mean is you could imagine many, many functions which take a pair of numbers and output a number, right? Given any such function, if you're an observer, say observer 1, you can take a point, you can measure its coordinates, you can apply that function to those coordinates, and you get some number. Most of those processes are not meaningful. Right? So, for instance, this one, I mean, the, the meaning of the word meaningful is context dependent, right? And I'll explain what I mean uh, in a second. But here's a function that's a perfectly valid function of a pair of numbers, uh, but it doesn't really have any significance. It's not a meaningful quantity to associate to a point in a pre I mean, in a plane with a, without a pre-existing coordinate system, right? Because the two observers will disagree about that. So, uh, so note that if I apply f to the result of observer one's measurements it will not, in general, be equal to the result of applying f to observer 2's measurements. Now, of course, if theta is equal to 0, they agree, for instance, right? And there's various other angles at which they agree. But what I mean by this disagreement is it's not the case that no matter what theta is and no matter what x we pick, those two things are equal. If no matter what theta was and no matter what x is, we had agreement then I would say the function f was meaningful in the setting we're discussing it. The norm, that is the square root of a1 squared plus a2 squared, is such a meaningful combination of a1 and a2 in that sense, right? But this is not. Okay, so that raises the question of, well, which functions are meaningful? So let's make a more precise definition. Okay, so we say a function f is coordinate independent um, I mean this term you may have seen before uh, one has to use it with some care right it depends on the exact setting one is using this term so in this particular setting what I mean by coordinate independent is that for any two observers whose systems, whose coordinate systems are related by a rotation, as we've discussed. 
be different if we were considering observers who were also translated from one another. That's also very interesting. And you come to basically the same conclusions. But for the moment, I'm just talking about rotations. So given two observers, um, if fm1 is equal to fm2 for all x and x, and implicitly I mean for also for all theta. So no matter what theta is, right, so f shouldn't involve theta. Um, so I have a function f which doesn't involve theta. And if for any theta and x those agree, then we say that, qu that quantity f is coordinate independent. All right, so then the question is, well, which functions are coordinate independent? Uh, I hope, I mean, this is a question you should be able to answer, right? So just have a think about it. In a second, we'll do the more interesting case, which is uh, probably next lecture at this point. Um, what are the coordinate independent functions of a pair of points in x? So this is, so the first question is, well, which, how do we characterize the coordinate independent functions in this sense? Okay, we've seen one example for length and one non-example. Okay, so. Oh, what's the answer? Which functions are coordinate independent? Let me give you one more example. I take the distance from the origin where both the observers sit to the point x, and I multiply it by 2. Well, both observers agree on the length, so they'll agree on the twice the length, right? Well, if I take the length and I square it and add 3 times the length, they'll also agree on that, right? Actually, I can do anything I like to the length. I can take any function of the length whatsoever, and they'll agree, right? And that's it. Okay, so lemma, the following are equivalent. Okay, so it's not meant to be a deep statement um, for a function f. Okay, first, um, f is coordinate independent in this sense. Um, f after r theta equals f for all theta. Right? r theta is a transformation of r2 to itself, so I can precompose with f, and if it's invariant under that operation, then I claim that's the same as coordinate independence. That's pretty clear from that diagram. It's basically the argument I gave earlier. Third, there exists a function, let's say h, which takes, I mean, we're thinking of this as the length, such that f of uh, v is equal to h of norm of v for all v in R2. This is what I said out loud, that the only coordinate independent functions will be those that are just functions of the length. That is, there's a function, I mean, this statement here is just formalizing that sentence. Okay, so I'm not going to prove this. This is an exercise. Uh, so by the way, I'll discuss more of the administrative aspects of the class next lecture. I wanted to get straight into it today. The lecture notes will contain, so I'll mention exercises during the lectures. Sometimes I won't write them down, but they'll all be written in the text and they're indexed. Okay, so this is lecture one, exercise one, for instance. The assignments, which we'll talk about later, uh, will be mostly made up of the exercises I'll assign in class. So I encourage you to just, when I give you exercises, go ahead and do them sort of immediately, right? And then you'll be prepared for the assignments. You'll have already done the assignments to some degree. Okay, so... That characterizes the meaningful quantities we can extract from the coordinates, meaningful in the sense that two observers whose system of coordinates are related by rotation produce the same answer. Right? Well, since this is such a simple example, it maybe doesn't look that significant, but we've extracted 
what we've discovered is that if what we care about is this kind of configuration of two observers whose coordinate systems are related in this way, then the only thing we're allowed to talk about is the length. Right? That's it. Anything else we try and talk about immediately is meaningless because the two observers are writing down different things. Right? So they can't, they're, they're, they're just in separate universes. They can't communicate about what they're doing. So if you care about rotations, you have to talk. I mean, the only thing you're allowed to talk about with a single point is the length. And then the next question is, well, what about pairs of points? Okay, so which functions which take a pair of numbers Which of those functions are coordinate independent, that is, sort of meaningful? And by that, I mean, you can guess the definition, right? So what I mean by that is, if observer 1 takes the first point and the second point and measures them and then uses the function to compute some number, we should obtain the same answer as when observer 2 measures those two points, writes down their coordinates, and then calculates. So for which functions uh, is that true? 